Alright, good afternoon to all of you, uh, teachers and students as well. Alright, so Dr. Amir has been kind enough to, to give, uh, give an introduction about myself and uh, I'm here to sort of let you know what are the necessary things which a teacher needs to understand and to sort of inculcate in his teaching habits. Alright, because teaching now is a profession which demands the very best. All right? We need to know what are those things which are necessary both within the classroom, inside the classroom, as well as outside the classroom. All right? So it will be my endeavor, it will be my endeavor to sort of let you know because as Dr. Amir has already told you that I've been a lecturer in English for the for past about 30 years now joined as a lecturer in, 19, uh, in 1983 and continued in various capacities, in various universities, all right? So I have a fair amount of idea as to what are the necessary things. Now, during my time when I began as a lecturer, things were very, very different, absolutely different than what it is today. For example, take the case of the computer now. Everything is being done by computer, teaching, etc. Everything is being done. But during my time, in, 1990, in 1983, we didn't have the computers actually in the classrooms. So the problem was of a, of a very different kind, absolutely very different kind. For example, I'll give you an example. Now, you see, preparing lectures, number one, you have to, now it's so easy, I tell you, you just have to sit on the internet and immediately your work is done. Isn't it? It takes you less than five minutes. But during our time, I tell you, we were totally dependent, absolutely dependent on the library. And that was the only source where, from where we could collect all the material. Alright, so as an upstart, remember, I was just 24, 25 years of age at the time when I began my professional career as a teacher. And absolutely everything seemed to be so difficult for me. But then, patience, as I said, patience is something of a virtue, you see. And I was happy and I was very, in fact, uh, fortunate to have come across very good, uh, you see, professors. My professors, that means my head of department and the other professors in my department, they were all so cooperative, all of them, that that was the decisive thing. And I can never forget their contribution, actually. And I was absolutely lost in the beginning. I didn't know how where to begin or how to begin and all that stuff. But later on, slowly, gradually, due to patience, etc., suddenly came across one trick, the second trick, the third trick, and then I could manage everything nicely. All right, but it did take me at least a year. That's for sure. It did take me at least a year just to understand what are the basic things and how I need to move around and what are the things which I need to avoid and what are those things which I need to inculcate as a teacher. You see, there are plenty of things which had to be thought of. Anyway, the thing is that I want to tell you is now after so many years, 30 years of teaching experience, I probably have a very varied sort of an, uh, uh, you see, uh, when I look at the past, of course, through a number of years gone by, learned quite a number of things. So I'll just let you know one important thing that uh, before I start off with all those necessary things which you are eager to know about, I'll begin with that. Just uh, uh, be with me for another two minutes and then I'll start explaining those things. So at the moment you see it's like this, worked in India a different socio-economic environment. Then from there and that too in India mind, mind you, you know various areas have got various types of uh, socio-economic problems of a different kind you see. Mm -hmm. You go towards the east is very different, you go towards the north is very different. So I initially began my career in the eastern part of the country. And then there, they, you see, the, uh, the capability uh, of, the, of the students, the comp competency of the teacher was very different, you see, that side. When I came to Delhi, again it was a new experience, absolutely new experience. I learned something which I had not learned before. I learned that as well. And then, after having worked in Delhi as an associate professor for almost like 10 years, then I suddenly had a chance of going out. And then when I went to Afghanistan, working for the Kansas State University's international program there in Afghanistan, then I learned a number of new things there also. 
So it, on the whole, it was a very, I mean, it has been a very good experience. And I would now like to begin and uh, sort of uh, share that experience with you. Because many of my colleagues here, they are all competent, I know that, absolutely well. But there might be a few things, a few things which people probably might have overlooked. All right, so the idea is here to share that experience so that we each of us benefit from that. Isn't it? That's the important thing. So the first thing that I would like to deal with is, you see, uh, by the way, one more thing before I forget. It's like this, you see, that in, I've been teaching many, many different type of subjects. Like every subject has its own type of a problem. You see, you cannot apply a certain rule in all these departments. That's for sure. Now, when you are teaching English, you have to sort of adjust and introduce something new. Other than, I mean, that particular rule may not be applicable for some other subject. So that has to be taken into consideration. For example, like when I was in Afghanistan, I taught various subjects. For example, like literature, writing, then the dissertation and uh, linguistics as well. All right. So uh, for different things, I had to adopt a little different. But on the whole, by and large, the things uh, remain the same. Where it differs, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right, now, just like, uh, now here, I'll begin with the positive attitude tips, right? The first one is that there are several techniques, agreed, there are several techniques, and they are all effective tools, right? But the important thing is to keep in mind that understanding a proper harmony has to be maintained first of all that's primarily the main thing that the teacher should keep in mind that uh, you see uh, bringing about a proper understanding between the student and students and the teacher is very important primarily that's the most important thing now how do we get that now you see trust in ourselves for it is you have to trust in yourself i'll give you an example I'm reminded of an incident which took place many, many years before. It probably could have been 25 years before. I was coming back after having taken my classes and it was a very hot day. And when I was crossing the road, I found that there was a blind man and he almost met with an accident. All right? And he fell. And when he fell down, I took pity on him. And when I took pity on him, I came there and lifted him up and I offered to take him home. All right? Now, many of you will think that I've done the right thing. But in fact, it turned out to be absolutely wrong. Because when I helped him, and when I took him to his home, which was about one and a half miles away, all right, on a rickshaw. Rickshaw means a hand puller thing. I took him there, and when I dropped him there at his home, he, he had two other friends with him, all right, in that same room. There were two other people staying. And those two people, they didn't have, uh, I mean, they weren't very happy with my uh, help, you see. So, one of them said that you have not helped him, you have, you have made him sort of a, you see, you have, uh, you have taught him something which probably will not help him. And then when I went back home, I thought, what was he talking about? Then suddenly I realized that yes, it's true, I had played with his trust. He actually was dependent on his abilities. And I went in and tried to help him, which of course was not good. Did you understand this point? So the point that I'm trying to make is that, you see, you have to believe in yourself. A teacher has to believe in his abilities. That's again an important part of the teaching career, you see. You have to believe in your own efforts. You cannot believe on your colleague, you see. You can believe on your colleague, yes, to a certain extent, you can believe. To, for advice, etc. Or, but the real work has to be done in the classroom by the teacher himself, right? A little bit of help here and there is possible, but he has to manage the class. He has to get every work done. He has to arrange for everything. In fact, so he, that trust factor, that is the most decisive thing, and it is, takes time. It takes several years to build that trust in yourself. That yes, I'm competent enough. I'm good enough to look after myself and the class and my students and to get that work completed, you see, that sort of a trust. 
All right, the second thing is that praise, you see, praise is very important. Now, praise means encouragement. You have to encourage your students. And I have known this from my own experience. Students who are not doing well, comparatively very weak in their studies. But often praise, you see, you have to be selective. You cannot sort of praise unnecessarily. But yes, when you, they need to be praised, they must be praised. Because it acts like a catalyst. You know what a catalyst is? Anything which speeds up a reaction, you call that a catalyst. This praise, you see, it helps the student. To, it motivates him. He gets that extra sort of an energy in him. It re-energizes him. And he feels that, yes, I'm, I, I, I'm competent of doing something which other people probably have never thought of. So it helps him tremendously. So that point also needs to be encouraged. I have got two other examples again. There were two students who were very weak in English. Absolutely weak in English. And they, but they were very good in science. Absolutely good in science because I was teaching all the three, uh, you see, the, all the three departments. Commerce department and then the, the arts department and the science department. Now these students were from the science department. Absolutely weak in English. Had to be weak because for them English was a third language. It wasn't a second language at all. You see, in India you have multiplicity of languages, 1600 dialects spoken. So naturally, the teaching of English there is much more difficult as compared to a country like China. In China, in China, the main you see language that your home language is is what you call Mandarin or Chinese, whatever it be. There is only one. But there you have got a multiplicity of languages, naturally I don't blame them. They had the problem and I, it was for me to, to help them because I was a language teacher. So I took it upon myself as a challenge just to see whether I could complete that work or not. And to be honest, you see, I do, devoted myself tremendously on those two chats. And by the end of the third year, because there the bachelor course is of three years. At that time it was of three years, now of course it's four years. So, in the last year of their bachelor classes, all right, immense amount of effort gone into it. And then they suddenly came up with that extra confidence in them. And then they took admission in the postgraduate course. One took admission in chemistry. The other one took in, phys in physics. And that boy, ultimately, he reached Bhava Atomic Research Center. You can imagine Bhava Atomic Research Center is a very big institute. And it requires the best men there. And it was only because of his English. Had he not put in that special effort for English, that boy would never have reached that place. That's for sure. Now the second thing is, this boy, the second boy, he was also equally weak. All right? And then I worked on him. And ultimately, this boy also came out to be very successful. Because he joined, he became a genetic, we call it, a genetic, uh, what do you call that, engineering. He did that course in genetic engineering and now he works for the All India Institute of Medical Sciences as a scientist. Now, what I meant to say was, you work upon a man, he is bound to improve. But that dedication has to be there. You see, you have to put in a special amount of effort for anything for that matter. You have to put in a special amount of effort and then you can reap rich dividends out of, it, out of that effort. Alright, so now it acts like a catalyst and it spurred them into action, right? Next point, offer constructive criticism throughout the term. Now when you give an assignment, alright, that assignment has to be checked properly. After having checked the assignment and then what do you do? Is your work over? No. It has in fact just begun. Why has it begun is that you have to call the students. So you can't call every, every student. You don't have the time. But you have to be selective. People who have not been doing well, people who have failed in that particular assignment, they need to be called and then it has to be explained to them. You can't do it every time. But at least on the first occasion, you can do it. See that? You can do it on the first occasion. Right? And that is the decisive thing. The little bit of encouragement, little bit of timely help given, and the boy realizes where his mistake is. Now, for example, many of there are at least seven, eight of my students here sitting here. 
and they know what I'm talking about. You see, a critical analysis. You need to be well versed with it. You have not only under you not only got to understand the subject, you have to also go into the internet, collect as much of information about it. Now, criticism doesn't only mean to find the bad things. It also means what are the good things. Now, in order to have a good, fair amount of idea, because my criticism, at least it's of a length of 350 to 400 words. Now, you have to, you just can't use, un, uh, write unnecessary things, because if you use unnecessary things, you lose your grades. So, they are compelled to look into that. They are compelled to look into the internet, collect as much of information as they can, and then with the class notes that have been given, then they formulate it. So that sort of an attitude is, is, I think, in this present scenario where the competition is increasing day by day, everywhere you have lots and lots of competition coming in, you cannot expect to get the best job unless you are the best. And in order to be the best, you have to believe that, yes, I have to do a good job. Now, who is there to look after all this? It's the teacher himself. So criticism is... You see, constructive criticism has to be given by the teacher. All right. Now, graded assignments have to be discussed in class, and it should also be shown on the blackboard. Many of my students are here; they know what I'm talking about. I show them on the blackboard, on the whiteboard. Sorry, we don't have any blackboards. It is all mentioned on the whiteboard. Everything is mentioned on the black on the whiteboard. The idea is. You, the student should know where the mistake is, to be honest. Otherwise, the student would be repeating the same mistake again and again and again. There would be no end to it. And there has to be an end to it. And the teacher is the person who, are, who, has, brought, who has got to bring about that end. Otherwise, what's the point in just teaching and moving ahead and the, and the student not understanding anything? It doesn't make any sense at all. So, Primarily, it has to be found that defect, that shortcoming, has to be found in the initial stages itself. Not to be, not to linger on, not to be procrastinated with, not to be played with. All right. Then you have respect and honor. Now, respect and honor, everybody likes in this world. Who is that person who doesn't like respect and honor? We people like respect. Students are equally human beings like us. In fact, they are much more younger than us and they need to be taught all the good things. And respect and honor is one of the best things that anybody could be taught with. So, it's primarily the duty of, of the teacher also. Days of punitive action and this and that is over now. You see, corporal punishment and all, these are all of the past. The more you love your student, the more you respect your student, the better results you have. And that's a fact. It's a fact. I've been doing it. For the last six years I've been here, I've been doing it, I've been given a student grade of 1.15, 1.16. I'm not trying to show that I'm the best. No, I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to convey the idea that if you are a good teacher and if you are really taking the pains of doing a good job, there is no reason why students should not give you the respect. And in the, in likewise, all right, vice versa, teacher also gives the respect to the students. And when you give the respect to the students, the students act, act more, much more intelligently, in fact. They put in that extra labor because they know that they are wanted. You see that feeling of wanting, that is very necessary. They feel they are a part of the family. A classroom is, of course, a family. Right? The classroom is, is like a family, you see. So the thing is that all of us should realize that respect and honor are two things which cannot be played with. Absolutely not. A good teacher will always pay the best respects to any student, whether the student is lagging behind, whether the student is very good, exceptional, whatever it be. But a uniform pattern has to be, you see, has to be inculcated, that sort of a feeling. And it does show good results. All right, so we have to be a natural pipe piper. A natural means a trainer, a good trainer. And a pipe piper, of course, means good mentoring. Good mentoring reaps rich dividends, and respect and kindness is always repaid back handsomely. 
Always remember that. I find that many of these students here are the teachers of tomorrow. They are doing a special course in education. So it's good for them to learn all these things. All these things comes from hard experience actually. Practical experience. It doesn't come through textbooks. Textbooks are just vague matter. But when you start doing your job practically, then you come across all these problems. And then you learn to solve those problems also. Alright, so instruction becomes that more effective. Now, you see, after that, the need for regular introspection. This is very, very important, this point. How many of us actually do introspect? Very rare. It's very rare, I tell you. When I was young like you people, this idea never came to my mind. It never came to my mind. But let me tell you one very important thing. Without introspection, it's impossible to be successful. Not only as a student, but also as a teacher. You have to introspect as to where and when and why have you gone wrong. It's most necessary. And especially for a teacher, because the teacher is one, students are in plenty. You are not only playing with your life, you are playing with the life of so many students of yours. Now I have 344 students. Now I, if I do not introspect, I will be playing with the lives of so careers in fact, with the careers of 344 students, which I am not supposed to. I am not supposed to do that. Either I do a good job or I stop doing the job of a teacher. Simple as that. So introspection means you must find time to know where, when and why you have gone wrong so that corrective measures can be taken in time. You have to do it. Many of us don't do it, but it's wrong, absolutely wrong. If you take remedial actions at the right time, right, the results are bound to be 100%. There is no reason why anybody should not be doing well. But people don't have that time. People say that, oh, I'm so busy, I've got so many classes. Where do I have the time to do all these things? But let me tell you, the world is like, like a, you know, it looks very big. But if you squeeze the world, it becomes this size of a ball, the size of a ball. Meaning thereby that there are a lot of empty spaces there. Lot of empty spaces in the universe. You squeeze it like this, and the size of that universe will become like a like a tennis ball. What do you learn from it? You learn that there is enough time at your disposal. People who say I am so busy, they are absolutely the most foolish people around. There is enough time for everything, but you have to have that desire to get that. All right, special attention paid to discipline, attendance, submission of assignments, and timely grading. That's true. It bring, brings uniformity to the class proceedings and inculcates good habits. Very important thing. Now, if you have, do not, if you are not a disciplined man in your life, what are you going to be? You will be a nobody. You will be a waster. Discipline doesn't mean that you, that you get up at 10 o'clock and all this stuff. No. You have to have a proper time schedule for everything. In our olden days, I remember my parents always taught me, go to bed early. We used to go to bed, say, at about 9.30. And we used to get up early in the morning at 4.30. Can you imagine that? And that same habit is with me even today. I get up sharp at 5 o'clock. And I'm, I'm damn happy with it because I'm not in a hurry in the morning. Absolutely not in a hurry in the morning. I take my time. I, I take 20, 25, 30 minutes to shave. <laughs> no problems at all. And that's one of the reasons why I, I'm, I don't suffer from any disease. I'm absolutely like a, like a bird flying high in the air. Absolutely. No problems at all. So, you have to have that sort of a disciplined life. All right? Teachers especially, they have to be disciplined. And then they are disciplined. Automatically, it comes to each and every person in the classroom. It comes <laughs> automatically. Because teachers look up at the teachers, uh, sorry, uh, I beg your pardon. Students look up at their teachers as their role models. 
you do something good it will come down and students will try to imitate that they will try to inculcate all those good things but at least give it a try if the teacher comes to the classroom one minute late why shouldn't a student come to the classroom 10 minutes late has it ever struck you if the teacher comes to the classroom one minute late why shouldn't the student come to the classroom 10 minutes late what right have you got to stop him what right have you got to throw him out of the classroom what right have you to mark it as a tardy attendance you don't have any right you have to behave yourself first and then expect others to behave likewise so submission of assignments again timely assignments what about timely grading timely grading has to be done you collect your assignment this week and you give it back after 15 days do you think it will help it won't help you have to submit it I mean try your best to do it as early as you can you have your limitations yes you have your limitations but life is like that life is like that every profession has its own limitations we also have our own limitation we have to make the fullest use of it so this again again as I told you who, people who complain about time must think about that example which I gave about the universe squeeze it it becomes a tennis ball Now the next is collaborative effort on everyone's part. Now what do I mean by collaborative? I mean interactive class. It's very necessary to have interaction in the class. Without interaction, the mind doesn't grow. The mind doesn't grow. Did you, did you ever think of that? Our mind, psychoanalysts have proved it. That the mind, the human mind is 10,000 times faster than the computer but we people don't even use 0.025% of it we are not accustomed to using it we are not accustomed to it we have not been trained to use it that way so again interaction the key to the hour if you want to succeed in your life you must interact with people and the classroom is the best place to interact absolutely the right place because people are of the same age, almost of the same wavelength, all right? That counts a lot. Now, if people are of the same wavelength, of the same nationality, people of the same socio-economic background, then there is not much of a difficulty. It can be done. All right, now, the last is here on this page, aim at maximum interaction in the classroom and through faculty meetings now faculty meetings are very important regular ones because then what happens is we get ample amount of feedback we get our ample amount of feedback what is happening which student is happening which student is not doing well why is the student not doing well all these things can be analyzed together one mind may not be the right you see decision the right decision may not come from one mind but yes when there are 10 in, in intellectuals sitting in that room they can discuss it they can examine so many things and this is the reason why good institutions have good students because each of these students are under the direct influence the direct control of somebody watching them All right, now pride in one's work is very important to have pride. Very, very important. I'm going to quote Reverend J. Cocker. Now he said, if I were a cobbler, it would be my pride. The best of all cobblers to be. If I were a tinker, a tinker is a person who mends. A tinker, no tinker beside, should mend an old kettle like me. Now it's wonderful, he said. People who want to learn from this have got, I mean, this quotation is a, an eye-opener, in fact. Now, why did I say an eye-opener? Because 
You see, pride, let's look at that first line there. The word pride. Now pride means justifiable. Self-respect. Justifiable. Alright, it should be justified. Now, that second one, you see, I'll give you an example again. The Ambato Eco, in 1980, Ambato Eco was a, was a type of uh, a, a professor in Italy. Bolo it now. He was a professor in that university and he is a known person for semiotics, which is the study of signs and symbols. Now you can imagine how many students are there. Just imagine how many students would be there for studying signs and symbols. Very few. But look at his enthusiasm. He wanted to be something of great importance to do something for humanity. That was the motive. Now he has published 50 books on semiotics, study of signs, uh, signs and symbols. 50 books. And he began publishing it at the age of 22 and 23 when he had joined as a lecturer. And this man, he has, and why did it sell like hotcakes? The reason is that he put in that personalized writing, you see, about his own personal experiences, added it in that book. And that is why people love reading personal accounts. If there was no personal account there in that, what would be the result? Nobody would have bought it. Nobody would have bought it. Because this is about signs and symbols without any personalized things, without any examples, without any, any illustrations. Who would like to read it? So the point that I'm trying to make is where there is a will, there is a way. You have to, the teacher has to find a way to make the class interesting. Even if it's a dull subject, even though it's a dull subject, if the teacher wants to do something good, there is no reason why it cannot be done. Alright, my subject is very good. I'm the, I'm the happiest man around because it all deals with, with, with literature and literature is all about life and love and all that stuff. So I'm very damn happy with that. No problem. I'm talking about other subjects which may seem to be a little dull to students. But there is a way to make that interesting as well. So again, it's a matter of interest. It's a matter of enthusiasm. It's a matter of, of pride doing something unique, isn't it? That's very important. So, timidity and self-distrust. Now this is a note, a warning sort of a thing. That okay, all the things are good. But conceit and overconfidence have to be kept in mind. One has not... To fall a prey to that. Alright. So, word of caution. Excessive high opinion of self. We call it vanity. Impairs the judgment power. It impairs the judgment power. Should not fall a victim to it. Now, I have devised a certain rule in my class. I call that POLAC. POM LAC. PO means planning. O means organizing. L means leading. And C means controlling. I focus on these four things just to make it interesting. Planning, organizing, leading and controlling. I am not interested in any other thing. If I am able to do that correctly, right, my students would be the happiest people. All right? They would be the happiest. Because controlling means you are not allowing them to, to waste their time. Leading again. Leading them in the right direction. See that? I'll explain that later. I don't have that much of time just now. So, you see, all act factors that contribute to ideal conditions for classroom teaching. All right? Probably some other time when we have some more time, we'll discuss that Polak. What and how it can be used in classroom teaching. Right? Now, another continuing pride in one's work. Nothing was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Lesson plans. Let's talk about lesson plans. Lesson plans are most important. Absolutely important. As students of education, you should be knowing that without lesson plans, you will be aimless. You will be absolutely aimless. You wouldn't know where to begin and where to end. 
how much of work to be done in one day and how much of work to be left for the next day, you'll never be knowing it. And that way you'll see, see as if you are lost. When you are lost, what about the condition of your students? They will be worse off than you. So lesson plans are most important. They must be done. Alright? Then preview the day's work. You must preview the day's work. Now, how do you preview? Preview means before the work begins, you must analyze your work. Now, you come in the morning. How, long, how early do you come? Very decisive thing. If you come just two minutes before the bell rings, class, what are you going to think about? I don't understand. What are you going to think about? How will you go to the classroom and what are you going to begin with? You have to have enough time to go to the class before you have thought about the whole thing, your day's work. You have to do that. It's a part of your job. It's a part of your responsibility and accountability also. All right. So the next point, whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. Very good. Chairs are meant for students. Chairs are not meant for teachers. Teachers are supposed to be standing and students are supposed to be sitting. That's important. Isn't it? We must make our students comfortable. You need not be comfortable. You have to stand. Even if you have to stand for seven hours, stand. It's a part of your responsibility, a part of your work. If you sit, students will go to sleep. <laughs> it's so simple. Students will go to sleep. And if they sleep, your job is at stake. Your job is at stake because the results will not be good and you will be asked to go. You will be replaced by somebody else. Darwin's theory of evolution. The best survive. The people who are mediocres, they have to go. The truth is very simple. So, you have that, then in education one never knows what each day will bring. The teacher must assess the situation, deal with it to the best of his ability and move on. That means feedback, avail of the regular feedback and trust in yourself. Very good. Now, again introspection helps here as well. Sense of humor brings about a little fun into instruction. Who doesn't want to laugh? Who doesn't have tensions? In the class, there is always a tension. That tension has to be lessened. It has to be lessened to some extent. Alright? Lessened means to bring it down a little bit. Alright? And for that, laughter is the best medicine. So teachers should learn to make the class a little more interesting by making students laugh a little bit. Ask my students here. I, 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 I always make them laugh. There is not a single student of mine in 342 students who will ever tell that Dr. Sinha doesn't make us laugh. I make them laugh. I want them to smile. I want to see their teeth. Whether they have brushed themselves or whether they have not brushed at all. I want to see that. Alright? I want to see. Okay? Alright? Now, the first day of class is very decisive. Very important. Everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to know what the teacher is. How the teacher is. How is he going to react? How is he going to behave? Everybody wants to plan. You see, the teacher is planning. The student is planning. Everyone is planning. Yes, it should be like that. You have to know your teacher. And the teacher needs to know his students. See, it's a vice versa. Benefits both the parties. Both the parties are benefited. So, the first day is very crucial. And we all know that old proverb, remember? The first impression is the last impression. The first impression is the last impression. So the first day is a very decisive day. <coughs> very decisive. Later mistakes can be pardoned if the first day's impression has been a good one. All right? Automatically, people will say, oh, my impression about this man is very good. One or two mistakes is a humane mistake. He's a human being. He can make a mistake. But the first impression is bad. And then if the man makes a mistake, he can never be pardoned. 
See that? That's the, that's the difference it makes. Alright, so now look out for each other, a strong support system built. Now doubts cleared before moving ahead. Very important. All the doubts should be moved, should be cleared before the teacher moves to the next subject. You know what that means? It means that students should be taken along all the class. Now, all everybody in the class should be in the same boat. It's not like half the class in one boat and the rest of the class is in the second boat and four or five of them, their boat has capsized. Capsized means gone inside the water. It shouldn't be like that. A good teacher will always take everybody in the same boat and not let anybody drown. See, these are the qualities, the characteristics which are necessary in a good teacher. And we all need to inculcate those things because teaching is certainly not a, a small thing. See, you are playing with the lives. I mean, you lives are at stake. Young people's lives are at stake. You, you have, you cannot play with their lives. Now, the next is create policies and procedures well suited for classroom teaching. Very interesting. Now this is about class participation. Very important. How, how do you how do you sort of give encouragement to students to participate in the class? Ask them. My students say again. Again, my students, ask them. You see, they will tell you. I give them extra points. 10%. 10% of the total. And it's about notebooks. It's about class participation. And it's about, about taking a lead in the class. You see, 10% out of 100 is, seems to be a big amount, but it's not a big amount, I tell you. Class participation, especially in my subject, is a must. You have to develop your intellect. And the intellect can be developed only by talking and discussing in the class, because everybody benefits from that. Everyone benefits. It's the best way to improve. That's what I have learned. When I was a student, I was studying in one of the best schools in India, named as Sherwood College. And all my teachers were Irish. It's what it was, it, it is, it is still a uh, school there, 150 years old. And all of them were from Ireland. And they were very particular about this. They used to compel us, force us to speak. And speak boldly, courageously, with full authority. Alright? And probably that has gone into my blood now. It's a part of my being, of my existence. So that is one thing which I've never, I'll never forget. You have to teach your students to talk and discuss in the class because it not only benefits that particular student who is who's contributing, it benefits other students because they come out of their shell. They come out of their shell and they start developing that power which otherwise would not have been possible outside. It will never be possible because they will never get that opportunity again. You see, the point that I am trying to make is, this is the first and the last opportunity in college where they will be getting an opportunity to excel, to develop their intellect in this manner, in this fashion. Alright, so setting or accepting goals that are realistic. Yes, competency level has to be known. The teacher has to know the general competency level of the class. Alright, and then set a syllabus. You set a syllabus which is very high, and then that's no use. It's not going to work. It's a sheer wastage of time. It should be avoided. It should be avoided. You have to set a syllabus which is at the competence, general competency level of the class. And that can be done first week. First week the teacher watches understands and then makes a few changes here and there. It has to happen that way. If you continue doing with that old syllabus, because every year the competency level differs. It differs from one year to the other or one term to the other. It does differ. A little change. I'm not asking for a major change. No, not a major change. Slight change here and there. Probably it could be like this. The first few weeks you go slow. 
and then pick up the speed accelerate after that no problems but some amount of thing has to be done you see you have to take that into consideration if you follow that same principle for all the terms for all the classes then probably it may, may not work it may not work that like that all right so another 10 minutes i'm still i have i promised 50 minutes and i still have 10 minutes left all right so this is build a student teacher partnership can i trust this person can i respect this person what image do i reflect now this is both both it, it is applicable both ways the teacher plus the students students also think it that way and teacher of course also thinks because he's a human being he's a human being and as a human being he too has a certain amount of fear in the mind that's for sure all right so it is advisable that both the parties come to know each other quickly because once that faith is established then things move smoothly it moves absolutely smoothly otherwise there is a storm in the offing you understand what that means storm in the offing means Something might go wrong somewhere. All right, now after that, you see, initiate effective change in students slow in progressing. Now, ideally, none should be left behind. So, mentoring office hours. Office hours are the right place, the right time, and the right place for this work. The right place and the right time. All right for this work so my point my contention is that the teacher should make full use of the office hours it should not be a place where you just sort of think oh it's a nice good room air conditioner is on and this and that let's let's enjoy the uh, some play games and all that stuff it's not meant for that the simple truth is that office hours are the best time to get such things done for example weak students give them a time give them an appointment ask them to come clear their doubts there's no other time where the poor student the weak student can approach you there's no other time so that's the only opportunity where the weak student has so teachers should consider that and make full use of it all right there Now, never let emotions control you. Yes, students talking when the lecture is on. When a student is caught napping or not having the textbook, it happens. It happens with me also. I'm a human being. I'm not a, what do you call a, from outer space. Right? I'm not a man from outer space. I'm a man of this world. But it does happen. Textbooks are necessary. Now, the student, I don't blame the student for that. Uh, I don't blame the teacher for that because students have to be taught this. Without the textbook, how is the student going to read and understand? It's primarily a most basic thing. So the teacher can do one thing. Instead of shouting at the child, uh, sorry, at the, at the girl or the boy, the better thing is to call him to the office and explain the positive points why the student needs to come with the textbook or why the student need not discuss unnecessarily in the class that thing has to be explained he that you see all of you are no longer small children you people are adults if i talk to you like an adult you people will understand it better but if i shout at you you may not like it nobody likes it but if i talk to you like a man like a friend and I discuss your problems and I say that, listen, if you talk in the class, don't you think that you are doing an injustice to other students? Other students want to study. You don't probably want to study. But what right do you have to disturb other students? Now, you see, that way you work on their mind, you see. Work on their psyche. It might work. But even if it doesn't work, then try to find out another way out. Then try to bring in a punitive action. That might do the trick. And it does, usually it does.
right, so. All right, so lastly, never be intimidated as the teacher is in charge. Now, by in, intimidated, I don't see, I don't mean that the teacher runs away. It's not that. It means that the teacher should be able to withstand the provocation. He should be able to withstand the provocation. Withstand means you shouldn't start fighting. <laughs> that's, not, that's not going to solve the problem. But yes, you see, he can always discuss it in a, in a more uh, humane manner. And generally, students understand it. It's not that they don't understand it. I've never come across even one incident where I had to shout in the class, to be honest. There's a little bit of here and there, tips we call it, T-I-F-F-S. In the last 30 years, I probably had four or five tips. But generally, by and large, it settles down, you see. People understand that I have a career, I have an objective in mind, I have to work, I have got to work towards the objective. I can't waste my time. People understand that. So next is manage and reduce stress. Now, how do you reduce stress? Why do you? Why did I mention this stress? Because this is a factor which very few people think of. You see, when you are stressed, how can you work? It's not possible to work if if the person is under stress. So you have to de-stress yourself. And the earlier you do it, you learn the trick, the better it is. Because that way you would be doing justice to your job. You would be doing justice to the students, to everybody in fact, to, to yourself. Your health will be better, you won't have any, what do you call that, uh, uh, blood pressure. Huh? You won't have a headache, so you will be in a better frame of mind, better appetite, you will be having good things to eat every day, isn't it? Your wife will be happy, everybody will be happy. Alright, so mustn't procrastinate. All right, job which has to be done today, it must be done today. That also relieves the tension. It relieves the tension. I've seen many of my colleagues here. All right, Steve, for example. He goes back home probably at 7 o'clock. Not before 7. Many, many days I found him to be the last man going home. When people like him can go home at 7, why can't other people wait a little longer, finish the job and then go home? See, these th things are necessary. I want to think ahead. How is it going to help? What are the benefits? The pros and cons have to be weighed. All right, take on the hard stuff with avoidance. Without avoidance. All right, work hard on good time management. Time management, again, very important. All right, so time management is again a very important thing because I will call it interstices, open spaces, same as that which I told you. Anybody who complains about lack of time, no, unacceptable, unacceptable. When people like Umberto Eco, he wrote down 50 books, he was a professor, attending conferences, attending lectures, every, everything, and he, besides that, he was also a novelist. The first novel that he wrote, all right, The Name of the Rose, it sold 15 million copies. Just imagine, 15 million copies of that novel and 1980 was the year he published it and 1981 he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature for that book, for that novel. When people like him can do it, why can't other people do it? You have to learn the good things from people. So again, this thing cannot be accepted. Mustn't procrastinate, work hard on good time management, exercise regularly and keep fit helps the person to be energetic and lively in class. If you want to be lively, if you want your students to be active, you the teacher has to set an example. And how does he set an example? By behaving lively. Simple as that. By behaving lively. That's the only way to set an example. Alright, so allows, alright, so enough of oxygen means you will be in a better frame of mind. Run in the morning. That's the reason why I told you people, get up in the morning at 5 o'clock. Instead of getting up at 7 o'clock, get up at 5, go out and have a, have a jogging, you see, a fast jogging. Let the blood, let the circulation 
be strong and you will be strong, the students will be strong. Everybody will be strong. Alright, now the exercise regularly and keep fit is done. Now manage and reduce stress continued. You have nurture relationships with colleagues, very important. All colleagues need to be together. Because if the colleagues are together, the work is half done. It's done. Half of it is already done. There's less tension, less stress. Now be firm in dealing with classing rules and regulations. Discipline cannot be compromised. It cannot be compromised. Because if you, if you do not set a good this thing, then it, 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 it you know, what do you call that? The disease spreads fast. The disease spreads fast. And then it goes out of control. So, enough is enough. That sort of an attitude. Enough is enough. I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. Come what may. Alright, now, uh, be calm in problem solving and be optimistic, especially in a crisis or when an issue of concern arises. The mind works best when it is calm. Isn't it? We have all heard that. When you are annoyed, when you are angry, you cannot think. And even if you think, it's never going to be correct. So, be calm while you are problem solving and the solution will be there. You can easily get the solution. Now, positive again, take the initiative in the class, let the students be informed well in advance of the clear expectations. Avoid the guessing business. No guessing business at all. Alright? So, prior work done on the internet. Collect information, whatever you want. And then, support creative consciousness. As we have already discussed this, creative consciousness is the need of the hour. Anybody who doesn't believe in creativeness will fade into, what do you call that? Oblivion. You will fade into oblivion. People will never remember you. You will, you will not have an identity of your own. You have to be creative in this 21st century. It's a demand of the hour. You see, and this is what we are supposed to teach our students. Have to be creative. Otherwise, otherwise you can count yourself as dead. So support creative consciousness, students participation in largest capacity, capacity of what? Capacity to think ahead, plan ahead, act intelligently, so many good things. And then strengthens the resolve, the resolve to achieve what you wanted to achieve. Very important thing, you see. Many people think that I'll become this, I'll become that. But how many people become that? It's only because their resolve isn't strong. So we have to inculcate those things also in our students. See, many other things are there. So be comfortable with dissent, especially in humanities. Now, in humanities, there's always a chance to, to not to agree, to disagree. For example, you see, I'll give you an example. A student contends that in order to attract the attention of the rich, the poor collect all the rubbish, the garbage, the, the garbage that is strewn around and throw it at the entrance of the rich man's gate. Now, how many of you, how many of us will accept it? None of us. We don't accept such an argument. This is, this is not, pay, this, uh, I mean, under no stretch of exam, uh, 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 you see, uh, imagination can one accept it. Just to attract the attention of the rich people, the poor people, they collect all, all the garbage and they take it and throw it in front of the rich man's house. We don't accept it. But yes, the boy, if he has got good reasons for it, if he substantiates it with relevant examples, with relevant conclu conclusive evidence, all right, that this is my argument, let him think so. Who are we to stop him? Let him think so, but it should be supported well. All right? That's the thing. This is what we call that dissent. All right? But... Dissent has to be supported well. The teachers may differ on this, I agree. But anyway, that's uh, in humanities it's possible, you see. But in, of course in science and all, that's not going to work. All right, now underperforming, motivation, constant motivation, set a friendly mood and de-stress de those who are anxious. Now impromptu me meetings, very important. Students not faring well, they have to be called. And that problem has to be discussed. 
It has to be discussed. It could be a family problem. It could be many, many problems. The person may not be able to concentrate. He may not be able to concentrate because of other uh, problems at, at home probably. Now, unless you talk to the student, how are you going to understand his problems? So impromptu meetings will certainly help. So another proverb for that, a stitch in time saves nine, isn't it? A stitch in time saves nine. A student has a problem, that problem needs to be solved. How do you solve it? By having a meeting immediately. Call him, discuss the problem, and then probably 50%, say 60% of the problem would be over forever. He will realize his mistake probably, should. And then you have when asking questions, especially the sensitive ones, simply wait, let him gather thoughts, don't press him, don't force him. Let him take his time to answer the questions. It helps, certainly helps. You see, in a better frame of mind, he would be willing to disclose the irritants, the, irritating, the irritating factors. You would be able to disclose that in a better frame of mind. All right, and then respect the student's perspective and consider it arrive at a conclusion only after having weighed the pros and cons. Here, the experience of the teacher is also of great importance, utmost, utmost importance, I would say that. So it all comes from experience also. All right, now, what is the next one? The problem could be with student behavior. See this? The problem could be with student behavior, for example, incomplete assignment, calls out in class, disrupting the work of other students, repeated tardies to school, performing poorly in literature, or in any other subject, because literature is my subject, and that's why I wrote literature. So any subject for that matter. It may require a behavior modification program. So behavior modification program means like regular mentoring, proper upkeep of record to show that the progress to show the progress over the weeks. And then you have asked the student to sit in the front row for being easily observed by the teacher, possibly also being in regular touch with the parents of the concerned student. Now, if it's a very serious issue, the students the concerned students, parents will also be, have to be consulted. Because if the student doesn't listen to you, then probably he might listen to his parents. You have got to give him a chance, a second chance at least. All right. Now, next is conducting impromptu meetings. All these things are there. Have a free few alternatives. The second last one, have this one. Have a few alternatives to facilitate the change. Just having a meeting isn't going to work. You have to have a few alternatives in hand. You have to have it. Otherwise, just talking to him and not giving him a solution amounts to wastes of time. All right, and support your observations in clear, concise, and precise terms. Observations, absolutely clear terms. And this is equally important. Take down notes for progress evaluation for future reference. You have to go and take down notes. Now to summarize, need for time management skills, help students prepare for tests. This is also a part of a good teacher's job. And then build a relaxing environment, changes in sitting plan once a month. That also needs to be done, sitting plan, change it. So that people who are too friendly, they become, you see, they sit apart. And then changes, take time to relax, teach them techniques for it. Laughter is the ideal way to release stress, make discussion an integral part of learning, and act positively as a facilitator. And lastly, patience and perseverance are the keys. All right, with this, I'm, I'm still not finished. Now there's another thing coming up, very good thing for you, for especially for youngsters like you people here. Alright, look at that, chuckle, <laughs> laugh to your heart's content. Now, see that, when you breathe, you inspire, isn't it? And then, when you do not breathe, what happens? <laughs> what happens? You expire. That means, the person is dead. Now, this applies to teachers as well. Alright, it applies to us as well. As long as we are breathing, that means inspiring the class, we are alive. And when we stop inspiring the class, what happens to us? We die. 
Isn't it? <laughs> All right, so I'm done with my thing now. I'll invite questions from the audience here. Yes, sir. Okay, so if anybody has any questions now, I'll pull up here for Dr. Sino. I'll just pass the mic, pass the mic around so that the uh, camera can pick up the audio because we are recording. So does anyone, yes. Thank you. Um, so my question is about assessment, um, it, particularly when it pertains to uh, classrooms that have a very rich variety of different levels, particularly when it comes to language, as we can see here. Um, how do you go about from the different theories of assessment in not only making them fair, but also providing motivation and uh, that they reflect student achievement appropriately? What have you used in your class that has been shown to work? You see, I've got two sorts of grading systems. One is, of course, the written test and other things. One is about the class class progress. You see, for example, like in interaction, when students interact amongst themselves, what are those those ideas which are generated? Who develops those ideas? Now, for example, I ask them for a synonym for a particular word, along with an antonym. Now, if the, somebody comes up with that, uh, with a word, he gets a point for that. Altogether, anybody who gets 25 points and above 25 points, they get an additional 2% benefit. Right? They get an additional 2% benefit out of that 10% class participation, out of that 10%. So that motivates them to, to, to sort of come up with new, new ideas. But you are correct. Competency level will never be the same. It has never been the same and it will never be the same. Because in a class, of course, the level will be, say, the best may be about 90 or, say, 95 percent. And the worst could be about 55 percent. So there is no comparison as such. But the number of such people will, will not be too many. It's generally in between 95 and, say, say about 75. That's the maximum. So one can sort of bring them to a little closer, say, narrow the gap. It can be done by this adopting this sort of a method. But of course, somebody who is absolutely weak, what can be done about that? After all, you have got only 16 weeks to do it. And 16 weeks, in my opinion, isn't a big, you see, especially in language and all this stuff, it's not much, actually. So, but yes, the gap can be narrowed. Great, does anyone else have a question? Yes. Uh, doctor, uh, I can feel your passion uh, in teaching, even though you have taught about uh, 30 years. Uh, but uh, I think there is a popular phenomenon, no matter in China or in other countries. Uh, for example, after some teachers uh, worked for several years, they will feel or experience a job of art. So uh, could you give us some suggestions about how to overcome this? Uh, job burnout. What do you say? The last two words, please. Burnout. Job burnout. 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 Yeah. Burnout. 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 Yeah. Burnout. Burnout of who? Uh, teachers. As teachers. Oh, teachers. Uh, I know you feel very passionate about teaching. But, but what you uh, probably what you meant to say was that uh, some teachers, mm -hmm. at the age of say 60, mm -hmm. they feel as if they are burnt out, mm -hmm. that they are. They have, uh, expended, they, have, they have expended their energy. Yes, so they don't feel, maybe after a few years, they will feel bored about their job. Uh, they will lose their passion or enthusiasm for teaching. Uh, how uh, could you give us that? See, uh, you are absolutely correct in a way because teaching actually should be an enjoyable thing. You see, I. Sometimes what happens is people take up this profession because they do not have any other thing at hand. Now, but if they continue for say 40 years, if they have taken up this profession at the age of 30, and if say another 30 years they work, that means they are now 60. That means they shouldn't have felt it that way. Anybody who sticks to a profession for 30 years, 
that means that the person must have now taken a liking for that subject. Otherwise, the person wouldn't have stuck to that profession for so long. Did you understand this? It's all about liking. If you like to do something, you will continue doing it. But if you do not like to do something, you will discontinue it. It has to be that way. But you cannot continue with something which you dislike for 30 years. It doesn't seem reasonable. I mean, it doesn't sound to me like a possibility. Did you understand this? For example, I began my career when I was 24. And I'm still sticking to it in spite of the fact that I'm an MBA graduate. I did my MBA as well, Master of Business Administration. And some of my friends who did their MBA with me, they are now as general managers. Some of them are in very high positions. They are earning 10 times what I earn. But I continue doing my job in spite of the fact that I completed my MBA. I could have changed my profession, but I loved my profession so much that I continued doing it. So, if I had disliked my writing, I would have left my job, this profession, I would have left my profession long time back. I would have begun something of my interest. But I didn't do that because I preferred this better than uh, doing a managerial job. Which, I, I've got no regrets today. I've got absolutely no regrets. I've lived a happy life and I'm quite proud of it. But you are correct, there might be a few cases. See, exceptionals are everywhere. You cannot say that exceptions are not there. But generally, by and large, my experience tells me, if you stick to a job for 30 years, it's proof enough, it's evidence enough that you have loved the job. That is the reason why you are continuing with that job. You see, that's the point. Just to follow up, Chandra, like, do you think, is there any strategies, like in the 30 years that you've been teaching, that you have used to sort of keep from burning out? You see, I have maintained my health. The important thing which I would like to disclose is, I have maintained myself quite nicely. I have avoided, <laughs> I've avoided eating red meat, because red meat gives rise to blood pressure, raises your cholesterol level and all that stuff. I'm not a doctor, a medical doctor, but I know that if I eat too much of these things, I would have fallen ill. And if I had fallen ill, I wouldn't have been here. So the best important thing that I would like to tell you is, you stick to a job, good, but at the same time, you must maintain good physique. Do not try to eat in excess, drink a lot of water, <laughs> And do not forget to put your feet in warm water every night before you go to sleep. <laughs> do you know why it drains out all the, you know, your feet has the maximum amount of germs. The sole, the sole of it. You know that this is the palm. And the, this part of this leg is known as the sole. The sole has the maximum infection. And the best way to, to, be happy and to be active, lively, is to have a bucket of water, put your, put your leg, both your legs in that and keep it there for at least 15 minutes every night before you go to sleep because the, the soles are absolutely cleaned of the infection. No chance of any infection and then you will be happy. Okay. I'm not sure I can really follow up on such a great description. However, I have a question regarding curriculum. Yeah. In this competitive age, all, all of us teachers are often have curriculum foisted upon us, or we accept it as part of our, our job, our role. Sure. Have you ever found in your 30 years that the desires or demands of curriculum have collided or compromise your wishes in a classroom setting or your goals? Hmm. Very good question actually. It has. I've, I've had confrontation with this, you see. Many years before, I remember when I was working for Magadha University, Gaya. In 69, I had a collision in fact with my head of department because he was insisting on something which wasn't of relevance. 
It wasn't of relevance. And I was not the only one who, who, who raised that point. There were two other people. And ultimately we won actually. We, had, we revised the syllabus. But it was only after a great confrontation actually, which lasted for at least six, seven months. But we were happy that we could prevail over that. But after that, in Afghanistan and other places, I never had that problem. Even here, I've never had any problem of such kind. I'm free. Of course, we all follow the, the MSU pattern and all. But a little bit of changes here and there is always a possibility. It cannot be ruled out. It all depends upon, because you see, we are all consultants, consultants in a way. You see, anybody being appointed from abroad here has to have that sort of an acumen where he can or she can bring about a little bit of changes here and there. You see? So, nothing to worry as such. If you have a problem, you could come along, both of us could sit together and try to find out a solution. He's there, the third, third person there. All of, all of us are here for that purpose. We could sit together and, and try to chalk out a sort of a plan of action. Oh, please. I don't have a, don't have a problem with the In case, in yeah. case if you okay. feel like it, we, we, all three of us are, are there to, uh, to sit together. Does no anyone problem. else have a comment or a question? What? Yes. Now I'm a student, I'm not a teacher, but I still have some questions for like, will we um, have a profession in the future? And of course, when we choose a job, of course, we, we have a passion about it. Hmm. But when we become like, feeling that we are losing the enthusiasm, how can we improve it? With the last part, could you repeat that again a little louder? You feel that we are losing our passion. You're, you feel you are losing passion for the job? Oh gosh, listen, you are too young to lose passion so quickly. Okay, you are too young for that. You have not yet begun with your career and you have already lost your passion. Very strange. No, no, you better come and meet me one day. I'll, I'll explain a few things to you. And you will feel better after that. I promise you, you will feel much better. All right? Yeah, like at the beginning of every semester, students they start very hard, and they they become like, losing the passion. And they no, it's not the not the right method. What I would suggest is passion is something which continues. It should you should become. You see, it's a continuous process actually. You stop midway. That means you are not doing. A good thing, you see, you are, you are creating more problems for yourself. Passion makes you, it's the drive that drives you forward. You miss that passion in your life, you, you miss the bus. It's something like waiting at the bus stop and then having a nap and suddenly you find that the bus has gone. Something that way. It's not going to work. You come and meet me one day, I'll, I'll explain the whole thing, okay? You need some rest. Yeah. When are you going to see, listen, like students, said, yeah. I'll give you a very good example. Students who work hard for the next five years, they will enjoy their life for the next 50 years. <laughs> and people who enjoy their life for the next five years, they'll have to work very hard for the next 60 years. <laughs> Which would you prefer? Which would you prefer? Tell me honestly. Yeah, you, you are not, like, no, you don't have any option. There's no option left. You have to work hard. We people, do you know one thing? I honestly tell you, no boasting stuff. I was working at least 12 hours a day, every day, continuously, for 25 years. I, when I did my PhD, Mike, it was in the year 1994. And my guide, we call them guide, you see, people who help. My guide made me write 25,000 pages. Can you imagine that? 25,000 pages for my PhD. I was, I was mad. <laughs> I went mad. I used to write 10, 10 pages, you used to throw it off. No, write again. 
And I, I, I was cursing my luck that, I, that out of all the hundreds of people, he was my guy. I was cursing my luck. You have to accept. You have to accept the inevitable. See, work hard, you are a winner all the way. You stop working hard, nothing can, then there's no hope. You have to be the best nowadays. You either are the best or you are, you are nobody. Simple as that. Mediocres, no chance. Yeah, go ahead. They had a bad test and they think that with, I cannot get an A and I will drop the course. Okay. So what should be done with them? Maybe we worked hard for the test. No, what is your question? Those people who lose heart, so what is to be done with them? Is that your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's broken heart and we don't want to continue anymore. You don't want to continue? Yeah, we just want to stop, give up and drop it. And drop the course. <laughs> you see the thing is, those people, okay, now I, I, I have only one word for those people. They are either cowards, <laughs> simple truth, call them cowards. And cowards means people who are not fit to be in the college. They should be doing some other job outside. As I said, cowardice is not the key to this. You have to be bold enough. You have to fight your way in this world. Money does not grow on trees. You have to earn it. And to earn it, you have to work hard. That's the only alternative. No other choice left in the student now. No other choice left in the student. You see, just imagine the world's population now is 7.3 billion 100 years back, the population of the world was 5 billion. That means in 100 years, the population of the world has gone up by, by 2.3 billion. Now, if this continues, your life, other people's life, youngsters' life will become tougher. Our life was tough. Now, it has become much more tougher. You have to be the best. There's no other alternative. You see? So you mean the students who drop the course? They are hopeless. Yes. They don't have hope. And they should I'll not say that. The I've got no hesitation in saying that. And I've got no, no uh, good feelings for them. No good feelings. Why should I have feelings for cowards? <laughs> cowards die a thousand times. I'm not one of them. Why should I have a feeling, good feeling for them? Either they fight or they get lost. Simple as that, you see, let's face the truth. It's a bitter, bitter way of saying it, but it's a fact, you see. It's a fact. Ask, ask our friend there, Dr. Uh, Steve there. He knows better how hard life is. <laughs> see that? He teaches law. Ask him how hard it is. He's a professor of law. Does anybody else want to weigh in on how difficult life is? <laughs> <laughs> share their experiences. Okay, I think that will be all then. All right, thank you, Dr. All Steve. right. Thank you very much.